Chapter 5 What is total depravity? Little did I realize when I accepted the password of the Lime Creek Baptist Church how much time such an obligation would consume. In fact, those next two months, through and after the Christmas break, I had no time of my own. Between studies and sermon preparation and church visitation and hospital calls, etc., I spent the busiest two months of my life. I hardly even had time to inquire if God had answered my prayer concerning the young lady I had met, although I did find time to keep praying in that direction. It was over the Christmas holidays of 1970 that I found some time to read the books Dr. Sisk had suggested, plus several others on the subject of Calvinism. I decided to read them in a very objective manner, not reading according to whether I agreed or disagreed with the authors, but rather with a purpose to understand what they were saying. I especially tried to gain an understanding of a definition of each of the five points of Calvinism. Then, when school started once again in January, I would seek out Dr. Sisk, who had promised future help, after I had read the books. I would bounce my definitions off to him to see if I had properly analyzed the subject. Therefore, on the third day of school in the new year of January 1971, with several pages of notes in my hands, I made my way to Dr. Sisk's office for our appointed meeting. He welcomed me cordially, expressing great joy that I had not let the matter die, but was pursuing the study. I jumped right in by telling Dr. Sisk my approach. I said, Dr. Sisk, I'm going to give you the definition of the five points of Calvinism, as I have discovered them in my reading, and you correct me if I'm wrong at any point. He agreed, and we were off as we plunged into the subject of total depravity. Cautiously, I said, as I understand it, total depravity does not mean that all men are as sinful in their actions and deeds as they could possibly be. Rather, total depravity speaks of man's nature and potential and not his actions and deeds. Am I right so far? Yeah, you are correct, he said with pride over what he was hearing. I continued, when one says that men are totally depraved sinners, he does not mean that all or any man will or has ever come to the full extent of the sinful actions possible for his sinful nature. Not even a Hitler, as evil as he was, ever came to the full end of the potential nature of sin that he possessed. Rather, he was a picture of part of the potential of the nature of sin. Am I making myself clear, or is that a bit confusing? You're making yourself clear, and you're exactly correct. Well, I said as I caught my breath, somewhat surprised myself at what was coming from my brain and mouth, I found it helpful in my thinking to use the illustration of a stick of dynamite to speak of men's sin nature, as a Calvinist would see the matter. That stick of dynamite has the nature of dynamite, would it ever explodes and destroys buildings and people or not. Regardless, it is still a stick of dynamite. And it has the nature of dynamite, even if it never explodes. So, man by nature is a sinner. And even if he never comes to a full potential of his sin nature, he still possesses a nature of depravity and evil. Did you consider why man never comes to full potential of his nature of sin? Dr. Sisk interrupted. Well, since I'm trying to stay objective in this discussion, I, I would reply that the Calvinists would say it is because of God's grace shown through government, family, the preaching of the gospel, etc. I think the Calvinists would call that common grace. Dr. Sisk nodded approval and agreement, so I continued. Now, the Calvinist says that the reason men have such a hard time understanding the term total depravity is because it speaks of men's nature and not his actions. Many automatically conclude that total depravity speaks of actions, and they know men are not totally evil in their actions, therefore they say that total depravity could not be true. But the Calvinist insists that it must be remembered that total depravity speaks of man's nature and not his deeds. If one keeps this in mind, the Calvinist says, then total depravity is understandable. Dr. Sisk looks surprised. You have been giving this thought, haven't you? He said evidencing his amazement. Now, another question. Have you considered how this depravity relates to the fall of man and man's present ability or inability to become a Christian? I scrambled through my notes for the section where I had recorded something concerning this area of thought. And I begin again. Yes, um, the Calvinist says, and I was careful to stay objective over the matter, that man is totally depraved because of the fall. When Adam fell, he plunged the whole human race into sin. That is, 
We all have a nature of sin now because of the fall of Adam. This depraved nature, which came by the fall, includes a total inability in the area of spiritual things. The fall left man's mind blind and ignorant to spiritual matters. He cannot understand things in the spiritual realm, except the Spirit of God enlightens him. Furthermore, the fall left men's emotions corrupt and turned in the direction of sin rather than towards God. His emotions will not move towards God or center on God unless God enables him. That means he cannot love God in his own strength, and he will not seek or desire God nor the things of God, but rather he desires and will continually seek the things of sin. I looked up at this point to see if Dr. Sisk had any questions or anything to add. What about men's will? he asked. Was man so corrupted by the fall, and yet his will was left uncorrupted? No, 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 I continued. Man's will is fallen also. The will is not an independent entity that escaped the results of the fall. Even if the will was not corrupted by the fall, which is not the case according to the Calvinist, it could not choose God because of the results of the fall in other areas of man. That is, man has a blind mind and corrupt emotions, which these would influence the will and cause it to choose everything but God. Thus, man is in a bad, helpless state. His mind is blind to the things of God. His emotions are corrupt and set upon sin, and his will is fallen and powerless. That means man has no power within himself to come to God. Not only does he not desire God, unless God gives him the desire, but he also lacks the power of the will to come to God. Unless God gives him the desire, the will and power to come to Christ Man is lost forever. Dr. Sisk interrupted again. He had a class coming up, and so he had to draw this session to a close. He asked me one more question, promising to continue the discussion again very soon. He asked, In seeking to stay objective in the search you have undertaken, what problems and questions do you see that you must ask the Calvinist? He was correct. Some questions have gone through my mind as I've read the assigned books, and even now, as I had sought to verbalize the Calvinist position. Thinking back over what had been said, I pulled several questions from the back of my mind. First, for one thing, I would have to ask the Calvinist to explain to me the whosoever will statements in the Bible. Surely, it seems that if the Bible says whosoever will may come, that man is able to come to God if he so wills. Second, even further, I would ask the Calvinist about man's responsibility to come to Christ. If man is not able to come to Christ, how can God hold him responsible and judge him eternally for not coming to Christ? Third, I would ask the Calvinist if men will not desire and come to God unless God gives them the desire and power. What is the basis whereby God decides who will bring to himself and who he will not? I realized the answer to that question would soon be considered when Dr. Sisk and I got together to discuss unconditional election. When I arrived back at the dorm, I found Todd grinning from ear to ear again. He put down his comic book and asked once again with his usual fervor, Guess what? Who is she? I asked rather impatiently and without much interest. Old Todd usually only got that excited over a girl. I figured he had either just met a new one or had just got engaged to marry an old one. Either way, it probably wouldn't last very long. Thus, today's joy would be tomorrow's indifference. Her name, he said, pausing before laying it out, is Terry Lynn Lazeter. Terry Lynn Lazeter? I exclaimed. What about Terry Lynn Lazeter? Don't tell me you've got your eyes on her. Terry Lynn Lazeter was the girl I had met at the dinner, who had become an object of my prayers ever since. She wouldn't give old Todd a second look. Too much class. She would see right through him. That didn't mean he wouldn't try to date her. He got the chance, even though he knew I had a deep interest in her. Now, he said, would your old roomie and buddy try to cut you on you? Didn't answer that question, because if I answer honestly, I might have to say yes, if he could. But I did ask, well, what about Terry Lynn Lazeter? My heart almost stopped as Todd said. She broke up with her old boyfriend, 
over the Christmas holidays. And now the door is wide open for you. I thought you and I might double date on Wednesday evening and take the girls to church. I didn't doubt his information, told him about all the girls, available and unavailable, within a 20-mile radius. He had better information contacts than the FBI. He went on to explain that he had two, an eye on a little girl, who went to the same church as Terry. And it would be a who went to the same church as Terry and would be a good excuse to ask her out, if we could uh, double date. And then he said, could you lend me five bucks for the date that night? The information I just gave you ought to be worth at least that much, he quipped.